Well, hello there. My name's Mike Squires, and this is the Couchers Podcast, episode number 191. That's a lot. Um, and my awesome guest this episode is Mark Malman, uh, who lives in Minneapolis. He's got a star on the First Avenue uh, like Hall of Fame walk. That's pretty rad. He's in good company there. Um, I was introduced to his music uh, in the two two thousand six or seven. I did some uh, press PR press work for Bad Man Recording Company, and he put a record out called "Between the Devil and Middle Sea." I did tour press for him a little bit. I hope I I, I hope I did an okay job. I hope I did a good job. I, I just I want to do a good job when I do a job, you know, mostly. Um, but that was my introduction to him. That was a long time ago. He's put out a lot of music since then. It's all awesome. He's got a really positive attitude. He's super talented. Um, and. I loved this conversation. I love talking with Mark. I hope that you enjoy it too. Um, go check out his music. Go buy his records. Buy a t-shirt from him. Go to markmalman.com. There's links to all that stuff there. If you enjoy this podcast or this conversation or anything, I don't know, if you enjoy giving your money away and supporting people uh, who are making stuff, who uh, would love to transition into making stuff more full-time. Imagine if I had... Uh, full resources i would make ridiculous stuff i can't like the anyway i digress if you uh like couch riffs uh if you would support us on patreon that would be amazing i would love it uh patreon.com slash couch riffs your support is greatly appreciated <clears throat> Mark's going to sing a song. Uh, I'm going to release it the week after this podcast episode comes out. It's killer. What can I say? It's not my fault. I just put it together. Um, there's a host of other killer musicians on there. Great, great, great players. And Mark was the icing on the, on the cake. He sang this one beautifully. So uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, uh, Patreon supporters. You guys are fucking great. You're great. You know that? You're great. I like you. Um, and I like people who don't support also. Thank you for uh, going over and buying hats and t-shirts. Thank you for sharing and liking and all that stuff. I don't know. You know what? I don't know how the fuck Instagram works. I spend 20 minutes making a play along, you know, like guitar solo to a fucking Black Crow song or something. And it gets... 9,000 looky loos and I spend actual months, uh, you know, putting together the, the performance videos and then, you know, probably six hours compiling and editing the video footage together to make, to present it in the way that it is. And they get like two, 300 looky loos. How does that work? Does is any is anyone out there smart enough that they can help me with that? Cuz I need help. I would appreciate it. I know that I've only been asking you for stuff for the last couple minutes, but I want to before I forget of the things that I'm super appreciative of, I want to thank uh, Variety Coffee Roasters. Why don't you go over to varietycoffeeroasters.com? And take a look at that website. They have a great subscription service. Uh, you go over there, take a little questionnaire, real simple questionnaire, and it'll help guide you through their excellent coffee menu to the perfect coffee for you. And then from there, you can select when do you, how often do you want it? Every week? Every two weeks? Every month? A 12-ounce bag? I go through a 12-ounce bag in a week. You know, I don't even drink a ton of coffee anymore. Um, but every morning I drink variety. I love it. And I wouldn't steer you wrong. I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't try and pedal off some bullshit that I don't use myself. That's also the only place that you can get a Couch Riffs coffee mug. Boom! 
Uh, we have a collab. That's what the kids say, right? Collab. We did a collab. Uh, a variety coffee slash uh, couch riffs coffee mug. So you can go over there, add it to your coffee cart, and just buy the mug. It's 10 bucks. Or, or... You can add that coffee mug to your coffee cart, buy two bags of coffee. They come in little fancy, styly boxes. Uh, use the code COUCHRIFTS at checkout to get your mug for free. That's a sweet-ass deal. Thank you, Variety Coffee Roasters. You guys are fucking awesome. Also, thank you, River City Guitars in Spokane, Washington. You guys are fucking awesome. That's one of uh, two places in the States where you can pick up the guitar here, right here. See this guy? This thing's sweet. That's the Marvin Guitar CN90. Um, I worked on that guitar with Keith from Marvin. And um, I couldn't be happier with the way it turned out. You can buy that guitar uh, for yourself. Not this one. This one's mine. It's not for sale. It'll never be for sale. But you can buy one just like it. Hand built. It's got a P90. This one I swapped out because I'm, I'm, it doesn't matter. Uh, I still have the P90. Uh, this one, uh, just like this one, all hand built. You got a Wolf Tone P90 in there. Um, sweet. It's a sweet little rig, all mahogany. It's a ripper. You can get one of those over there at River City Guitars. And uh, if you've got anything that you want to sell, vintage, cool, used, otherwise uh, boutique get a hold of them sales.rivercityguitars at gmail.com tell them I sent you they're like family I love them they're rad they're great you know what think of how great the world would be uh, if we all treated the, each other the way we just want to be treated probably not going to happen is that what you say because people are uh, selfish nah really just try to not be a dick just start there <laughs> nice. What do you got there? Yeah. Some, uh, muesli? I have oatmeal. Oh, very nice. With some blueberries. Uh-huh. And Power I'm going to eat on good TV. Power food. Right. Cracking open a bubbly. What is, that? what is a bubbly? Is that uh, a... Just strawberry sparkling water. Oh, nice. You know what I did uh, yesterday? I went out and bought myself a soda stream. Oh, man. We're not recording, are we? Oh, yeah, we are. Oh. <laughs> you betcha. Uh, I, you know, I think about those, but <clears throat> I like cracking open that can. I do, too. Here's the thing. I wanted to make sparkly coffee. And uh, I did that today, and it was delicious. It was so good. Uh, yeah, I heard that. I put some, uh, but you have to sweeten it with something. So I put a little uh, concentrated lemon, you know, undiluted lemonade in there and simple syrup. And it was, yeah. it was a delight. I have just this summer heard about people mixing coffee and lemonade. Very and good. I'm surprised Lana Del Rey hasn't written a song about it yet. Right. <laughs> but, but I've heard of, uh, I, I remember when I used to drink, we used to mix um, Coke and red wine. Right. And that's like a big thing in Spain. Uh, Lana Del Rey hasn't written a song about it because there's not enough DMT in it, in the, in the lemonade. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I don't know. I mean, I, I know that Lana Del Rey is a, total persona so i imagine that i imagine that she um i wonder if she does dmt i mean lana del rey the character does dmt but right if, if lana yeah. del rey actually <laughs> I, you know, I don't know i like her records though i think she's great yeah i think so i think that it's easier to write from the standpoint of a persona because her name is elizabeth woolridge grant i had no idea that that was a stage name but i'm a fool for i mean i well, should have known it sounds like a stage name she 
yeah, you know the story. You can look it up. But I think that writing from a persona can allow an artist to um, really reach into things that their ego has been blocking them from writing, you know? So I think it's a great technique. I mean, from Ziggy Stardust to Eminem to Lana Del Rey. Kiss. It works. In the case of Chris Gaines, we know it didn't work, but... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, you know what did you did you hear that record i don't know that i heard it i've never heard it um and mariah carey has had the starts of a um like a grunge uh no grunge singer. yeah really yeah. Mm-hmm. she was gonna make a grunge record under a pseudonym that's crazy talk I would still I mean, like to see that. Yeah, I would too. I think it'd be fun for artists to do more Ziggy Stardust style things. I imagine with an artist like Garth Brooks and Chris Gaines, you have so many people in the mix that it, it ends up being like a Marvel movie where you can't really, you know, you can't really get to the to the raw thing because there's so much, so many cooks in the kitchen, you know? Right. Um, but like, you know, um, like Jay Dilla had tons of, right. Or no, MF Doom, Jay Dilla. Uh, did Jay, wait, did Jay Dilla have personas? Oh, maybe God, not. I'm thinking of, yeah, MF Doom and also who else? Who's the guy from Oakland? Um, uh, Dre Dog. Okay. Jay, Jay Dilla just goes by JD. That's what I was thinking. Oh, uh, so Dre, uh, I mean, I think Mac Dre, really good. Mac Dre slash Dre Dog slash um, Andre Nicotina. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it works really great, you know. Um, so, and I think the case of Lana Del Rey, it allowed her to think of some really amazing lyrics, just astounding lyrics that probably you wouldn't be able to do if you were telling your true story. Or if you were Elizabeth. Yeah, right. Elizabeth <laughs> telling her story is totally different than this character. Right. And once you're on stage, you're a character anyways. I, I like that feeling. I, I like a good dress up on stage better than rolling up. Although, uh, you know, I take it back. I like rolling up and, and playing a set of straight rock as well. When was, I mean, last, when was the last time you were on stage? Uh, February trekking, February twenty second, twenty twenty. That's a that might be the exact date that I was on stage last. Okay, that's crazy. Yeah, I I, I mean I've done so many uh, live streams and um, TikToks. It just it seems like a a growth period and I toured for so long and and played dives and bigger stages for so long that like I I mean I'm going to develop a new persona for this next show and I might go on that I, I needed a big change and so this this break actually was a blessing to me I, I was think able it's... to step out right Are you, and so it's easy for you, was it easy for you to take this time and say, okay, I'm going to make the best of it? Or was, because no, no one thought it was going to be this long. Everyone was like, all right, we have to stay inside for a month. Are you crazy? But <laughs> here we are, right? And yeah. Um, was it when, at what point did you realize, okay, I need to, I need to make the best of this time and try to just be positive about the whole thing. No, there was no point that I I found any positivity in it. Uh, It it was hard every day. Right. Um, I think TikTok allowed me to just like not like it allowed me to just just explore music history and be free from this idea that you're beholden to 
your catalog. You're beholden to your commercial success now versus for me 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And it, it, it was it was a complete existential, like, I don't even know. I, I started buying all these neon clothes and I was wearing neon clothes around the house. I didn't even think about it. And then <laughs> uh, I went to the art museum was my first like excursion post-vaccine. I met my buddy, a saxophone player, and and uh, I was in these neon clothes and I felt completely out of whack. And then uh, I've thrown all the neon clothes away and now I'm back to wearing black. <laughs> <laughs> so if something happened that I wasn't even aware of, you know? Do you think it's subliminally you you want like you were seeing base do you live alone i do so mm -hmm. the only person you're seeing other than like situation like this or go you know having your groceries delivered or going to the grocery store with a mask on is yourself so you think you were you did it subliminally to have a little variety <laughs> i mean i i have no clue but i i think i'm i was you know, if I, I did write and release an album in, in during, I mean, I started writing it four years earlier, but I finished an album and released it mid pandemic, mid lockdown. Um, so, I, I mean, I think there's some subconscious crap in that record, but, but our, the art we make is so controlled and so edited and it's a perfect version of our own uh, perceptions of what life is and so I felt like this neon clothes thing was was an aside and sometimes in life we can see the truth more in the asides than we can in our catered mythology of our own selves which is basically what music is when you're not uh, uh, a persona <laughs> which our ego is a persona anyways we're a persona our whole life so uh, for me it was like wow I, I did become someone new and and that person doesn't totally fit in the world but I did make some big changes after after I got vaccinated which was I'm never fucking sitting on that couch again and I just said I'm not watching tv I'm, I'm done I quit tv and um <laughs> I quit going to see live music too I haven't seen a live show since I don't know, since the last one I played. Really? I saw I saw a show in a very in a small venue um, where everyone was masked up. Yeah, it's not even to me. Yeah, I mean, I would I would go with a mask and and if there was something I wanted to see, I just um you know, I toured for hardcore for 10 years, six six five to six months a year from 2003 to 2013. And then I and then I just um, was doing one one tour a year, and I guess I get to you get to a point where you're like you know I've been to Disneyland many many times, and um, I'll tour again. But um, yeah, I just uh, I love live music. I adore it, but um, I don't need to do it every night. I realized. You think that you would have reached that destination in your mind if if this hadn't happened? Not at all. You no way. Kept hammering. So many things changed that were, you know, it's like if you um, if you try to dam up a river, the water just goes in a different direction. Sometimes it goes back to where you know, the stream or the creek when you're a kid, when you put a bunch of rocks in a creek and then you watch how it changes. Sometimes it go back and sometimes it just to totally takes a new turn, you know? Right. So I don't know, man. I mean, musically, um, musically, I really started uh, getting into funk, understanding what the funk was and, and what James Brown was talking about by the one, mm. what he meant by the one and the significance of the one. And I really started like intellectually understanding what funk was and exploring that because I had never fully ex been immersed in it. So I, I, I got far in that direction. But there was a lot of days of just sleeping for 12 hours, you know? Yeah, I think that's pretty common. That's, <laughs> I think that's a pretty common story. Make this thing pass, you know? And, and, and so... 
Yeah. So now I, and I was composing the whole time for work. You know, I mean, I, I work here in my studio and, and I was composing for TV shows and stuff. So it was, I was lucky that I didn't have to go to a bank or, or, you know, work in a bank or ride the bus to subway. I was really lucky. I'm right. grateful for that. Um, do you have, do you have an, an alternative plan in your mind for how you see rolling out your music in the future and how you see presenting it to people outside of touring? Well, I figure like, um, I feel like the, the commodification of music, which was, which is an essential component, um, you know, from the, from the 45 to the LP, to the cassette, to the CD, um, creates this mythology, commodifies the, the person, the musician, and um, by decommodifying the person, unless you make shirts or something, I think you free the person from, uh, from the art, from the confines of what society says art should be and what music should be, because we see a lot, a lot of artists, you know, from bedroom pop to styles of, you know, like um, top 40 radio is trying to keep up, but it, it can't. They're like hyper pop's never going to get top 40 radio. Top 40 radio is not going to get it because it doesn't fit the format, but it hyper pop is a real thing uh, that is reflective of our relationship to digital media and the sort of um, mishmash of, a, a multifaceted intellectual world. So, I, I mean, I, I, um, I, I don't really know. I feel like there's so much um, relevance to performing live via digital media than live in a club. It's not as visceral, but but we always but we change with the technology, you know. And music is always. Music is the result of a technology, you know, so. I'm working on a project that is fueled by that very concept. Like popular music is the, the length of a, pop, of a pop song was dictated by the capacity of a seven inch 45 RPM record. Right. Right. And then when an LP came out, the dick the it was it still dictated the length of a rock song right and now rappers realize that if they make their song shorter they get more spotify plays so they're making short rap songs right you know? so the, the technology always will dictate the music you know music is a vessel but you wear the vessel but you know we need something to um manifest that music right so so the technology will always dictate where we go. Always. I mean, there was a uh, there was a moment where everyone had a a hidden song at the end of their record when right? the CD came out, right? And that was very. Hold on, let's real quick. Yeah, sure. Right. Uh, yeah. Right, a hidden track, like like the great hidden track for me, is uh, on the no alternative comp, uh, the Nirvana song. Uh, verse chorus verse right which was originally sappy uh because before that i mean if you had a you couldn't have a hidden track on a record you're looking at it <laughs> how would you you're do it a, right <laughs> what is it inside the label <laughs> maybe it's in the <laughs> that's cool on the, on the inside of the label like the label is a more of a donut than a circle mm -hmm. but you could you could put backwards masking on a on a record I did have, God, was it a um, uh, De La Soul record that had two sets of grooves on one side? Sweet. Which is crazy. I mean, it was just like, uh, yeah, two sets of grooves running parallel. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of such a thing? That's the only record that I've ever seen that was cut like that. I am not a vinyl person, but... Um... But I mean, I, I, 
you hear of all, all kinds of things like that. And people were creative with it to a point. I'm sure the label was like, come on, guys, this is going to cost so much money. Right. You know, uh, but most art is always uh, not going to turn a profit. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I would love to hear that record. I don't know which one it is. Do you, what, which one is it? I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. It was, okay. it was a 12-inch single um, I, that I would spin on. I had a pirate radio show that I used to at, back in the 90s. What's your project uh, that you're talking about? That's a <laughs> technology project. Um, I haven't. You know what? I'll tell you about it. I will. I, I haven't talked about it yet, but okay. it's the music is done. Essentially... I made a record of 15 second songs because I started two years ago. I hadn't, you know, I got it three years ago. Maybe, I don't even know. It's been so fucking long now, but I was learning songs when I realized I wasn't going to get phone calls to go out on tour living up here in the Hudson Valley. Um, I was like, well, I guess I'll just pick up my acoustic and see if I can sing, you know? and not play bass or guitar just pluck pluck on the acoustic and sing songs because i've never been a singer so i started learning covers and then i was like i'll record myself and monitor myself and then uh you know a couple of them sounded pretty good so i posted them on instagram and stories but it was really annoying because of the way it would split the videos up and just the annoyance and eventually fueled me to you know, inspired me to just write 15 second songs. That was my limitation. I would write one every night. And then I decided to actually track them. And then I thought, well, I mean, this, this is the new 45. This is the new seven inch Instagram stories. Like this is it. And do you pay attention to your analytics? Ah, uh, no. <laughs> I mean, if you, it's, you know, it's, it's probably best, but I took a very clinical business product sort of angle on this because I was like, I mean, I see how the retention that one of my full posts has. What's my incentive as a business to produce something more than 15 seconds long? Nil. Like, other than to fulfill myself. But that's not what this project is about. This project is about producing a, a product based on the environment that uh, popular media has revealed. I think it's a great idea for a project. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's that um, on, the, on the They Might Be Giants album, The Mollusk. They have yeah. a bunch of those tunes and <clears throat> Abbey Road has a bunch of short songs tied together and and ultimately the length of a song is is uh, a social construct right it doesn't contribute or take away from its validity well think about all the big band music that could never even get cut onto a record back in the day because by the time a 33 came along that music was dead you know, it was a, it was dinosaur music. No one was recording it. People were on to other, like, you know, simpler pop forms. Um, there's a lot of big band music that just died with that. Cause, uh, you know, 78 went too fast, you know, just went by too fast. I, I don't think there's anything wrong, um, with music dying, you know, Godard said art is the child of its time and um the the thing about is um you play a, a concert and there's well in my case like you know right now 300 400 people and then um two hours later I'm back home in my bed and <laughs> where, where, where did all my friends go we were all really good friends two hours ago and now it's 3 a.m and I'm here in my bed what happened and live performance is so transient you know it's just about the the moment and then the moment is gone uh recordings are s sort of like that too because you have to 
turn the faucet on. You have to turn the album on in order to hear it. So music is 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 growing like like a river or something. It's is always evolving and, and changing with with the time. I, my dad um, and I were walking across this path. We call it Mom's Path because Mom used to walk on it all the time when she was alive and. So we would go down this path and there's a bridge and it goes over the Fox River in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And my dad likes to point out when we walk over it, he said, do you see that right there, that big mound? And there's like um, uh, a, a kind of like a, a, I don't know what you call it. Like a, there's a, a large, not like an island, but it's jettisoning itself out like maybe um, 15 feet, you know? And he said, that wasn't there 10 years ago. And he said, but, but, but things change in life and the, the river shapes itself. And um, I feel that that's how music is too. It shapes itself. And so big band is, is still alive, but it, it's also dead. Yeah. <laughs> so we prohibit ourselves from really like growing and, and like swimming in the river or riding on the river. If, if we're we're trying to navigate this river from <laughs> uh, ten years ago when this big piece of mud wasn't coming out, and it's weird, like people who do live totally in the past. I mean, I do a music history TikTok, so there's it's a lot about the past. But uh, you, you, if you don't do new things constantly, um, I think you end up. I heard this great quote: "You don't want to live the same year seventy-eight years in a row." So I think it's really smart to try. Uh, I did a rap record uh, a year ago and, and nobody knows about it. I, I just put it up on Spotify and told my friends, you know, and, uh, and, and there's nobody, I mean, real literally zero followers, but it was, it gave me a whole new understanding of, of rap and hip hop. How's your flow? Um, do you have a model do you have someone that you were like trying to channel are you were you were you going for a contemporary style or are you like a run dmc ll cool j kind of guy oh uh it 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 sounded like eminem oh but Uh not i don't agree with eminem's uh ethics uh so the the lyrics are most about gas station food gas station pizza gas station coffee <laughs> everything about gas stations candy soda yeah a lot of snack wave nice. and, yeah <laughs> i like that uh, yeah yeah i love a good concept album <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think most of the great albums are concept albums i mean whether or not they're intended i like car wheels on a gravel road by lucinda williams is is conceptually there songwriting wise and on a, on a, on a production wise, you read about it. They went really specific on it. It's a that's an example record. of a concept record. That's not like a rock opera, which can be pretty annoying. Right. So yeah, this was a rap concept record that I did for myself. You know, I, I did, it wasn't, and I don't think there's any right or wrong reason to make music um, or incorrect way to to pro to create it um only what we find value in so right i I, i'm happy with the record it's great so since february 2020 you've put out two records (laughs) yeah i put i did i made a rap record and that might have to do with like the neon clothes like um was was that the real me? <laughs> it was, uh, oh, I don't know. I think it was 1995. Uh, Dan Geller uh, from Vision Video, that's his band now. Uh, he he ran Kindercore Records and we grew up together. And we decided uh, that we would spend New Year's Eve locked in a room. We took all the furniture out of this room and we had one red ball and we put it in this room and then we took the clock out and we went in at 10 and we said, we'll, we'll just come out when we think it's New Year's, 
we ended up coming out like four hours later. Were, were there we're psychedelic what? drugs involved? No, no. I was still, I still was straight edge. And um, we, we, uh, we didn't talk to each other. So we took a vow of silence for four hours. And um, he hates me. He hates me talking about it. He feels like I wrecked a New Year's Eve for him. But, <laughs> but I feel like when we were within that space, we developed our own language. We invented games and we, we were just, we were creating a world that didn't apply outside of that empty room with no clock on New Year's Eve, the antithesis of what you're supposed to do on New Year's Eve. So the rap record, which I made, uh, which isn't under my name, it's just under a, a name. And, um, but it, it, it did, maybe it did only make sense in that reality that existed for the year when everything was stripped away. Um, it might be the most sincere thing I've ever made because it doesn't, it doesn't apply to the outside world, <laughs> you know? How many gas stations did you visit during the period of making the record? Uh, not many. Uh, I, the, I'm in Minneapolis, so many of the gas stations in my city were burned down. Uh, my neighborhood gas station was burned down. I live six blocks from the George Floyd uh, site. Uh, so my gas station was burned down. <laughs> you had to drive kind of far for like probably three or four months to get gas. Um, and the gas station that I go to, the Speedway, uh, was uh, was gone. But like on the road, on tour, especially when you're like out in New Mexico or in the desert, you, you eat at a lot of gas stations. You know what I mean? I do. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of hot case food. <laughs> yeah. A lot of JoJo's. Yeah. Or like in the South, uh, South, you can get gizzards. And Chicken gizzards. It, yeah, at the gas station. You bet. <laughs> Hot you peanuts. Bet. Yeah. I love uh, it. You've always lived in Minneapolis? Oh, uh, I grew up in Milwaukee and uh, I studied in Milwaukee. Then I came up here to go to art school. I moved to Seattle and then I came back and then. Wait a minute. I, you lived in Seattle? I did in the 90s. Yeah. What During what period? Uh, 95, 96, 96. We may have met. <laughs> we may have. I lived in Seattle. Where did you live? I lived in Ballard. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, were you, yeah, I lived in Ballard and uh, just, I was doing Pro Tools stuff. Uh, Pro Tools, I learned, I knew Pro Tools too. <laughs> uh-huh. And uh yeah, I, I didn't, I performed like once uh, and then uh, would go to, go to stuff, um, concerts and parties. Uh, so if you, if you were at the um, radio had the Ben's show I wish. after party <laughs> at the crocodile back room, we could have met then. <laughs> uh, did you go to a lot of club shows back then? What were you seeing? in Seattle at that I was, time. I was, you know, I was doing that poetry slam underneath oh. the freeway um, at the- OK Hotel. OK Hotel. I was doing that every week. So you probably met Guy Davis? Yeah, for sure. He's a good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you probably went and saw Critters Buggin'. Yeah. Huh, yeah. look at that. It was a cool time to be in Seattle. Uh, REM was doing um, yeah. Monster at Bad Animals. And uh, I had, <laughs> he, he was, we were at a party and he was walking up toward me and I, probably because of my girlfriend, uh, maybe not, I don't I was talking, Johnny Greenwood was next to me and, and we just happened to be standing where these people were. And I, I didn't know anybody, I was just scared. I was just scared and, and he came up and, I just walked away. <laughs> and so like, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm not famous. I'm not trying to say I'm famous or name drop, but I, I, I think this story is funny. Um, in 2009, 2010, we, we were playing at the, my band Ruby Isle was playing at the fucking, uh, uh, this pop club in Athens, Georgia, the 41. Yeah. 
Dan Geller, the guy from the um, from the locked empty room, he said, "Oh, Michael Stipe's going to come down." So I met Michael Stipe again. I re-met him. Did you walk away again? That would have been fun. No, I, it was so cool. <laughs> After the show, he was super kind, and he said, "That was inspiring." And that's like that was the best thing to hear ever. I was like, "Oh shit, man!" And we talked, you know, about nothing. You know, because when you meet someone famous, you don't want to talk about their work, you know. Right. But I did say, I did say, um, do you remember the Radiohead after party when you guys were recording Monster in Seattle? You're recording Monster and Radiohead played at the theater and then at the Crocodile, there was an after party. Um, you know, I, I, I was there, I was there and I was standing next to Johnny Greenwood and you came up and he said to me, Mark, every night of my life has been like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, holy shit, this guy, wow. You know, cause to me it was like, like, wow. I was at this, the Benz is before I could, okay, computer. And I was like this big moment. And he was just like living in a different reality. He but is essentially one... retired, am I right? I mean, mm -hmm. he's just not doing music, Michael Stipe. He wasn't doing music that night. Uh, I mean, he's clearly someone who does not give a fuck about being in the spotlight. No. Even though he sang, that's me in the corner, that's me in the spotlight. Right. Losing my religion, but... I think that like an artist of that level of integrity just does what they do. And, and some of us are born without, without the ability to contextualize how we fit into the world and just be a force and just speak our truth. And I think that that's what Michael Stipe does. I say are in terms of like the 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 idea of humanity itself and artists i i don't i'm not that way i don't i but I, I every so often you meet people and they just yeah you know th that artist like speak sp spoke his truth i i don't think he cares either yeah he probably never cared about <laughs> fame we're uh, as a kid we're about the same age i'm a couple years older than you um you just had a recently had a birthday happy birthday the lady. um were you an rem fan growing up or or was that uh was that not like what were you into yeah i was i mean um i i was uh introduced to music via um the sesame street box set a uh, little yeah. seven inches. I love trash. People in my neighborhood do the pigeon. Really well written songs. And uh, by let who, a smile, who knows? Let a smile be your umbrella. I don't know that one. Oh, that was a great one. Yeah, I I don't know that one. And I, I wonder if PBS. They must have been collecting royalties on those songs, but um, they uh. And then I, I heard ACDC. I didn't like that when I was in second grade. And then I like it now. Uh, it, 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 what really woke me up was like Pink Floyd. And then uh, then learning about um, King Crimson and, and uh, Frank Zappa and uh, PIL in, in, in like 10th grade. You know what I mean? So art rock immediately was immediately. What, what drew you in. Immediately. And, and REM was kind of kind of kind of doing that you know uh my friends were into it and i remember hearing losing my religion and and you just it was just i still don't know what it's about um and i think that's a poignant uh stance for a song to take uh, uh stairway to heaven does that you know these songs that aren't necessarily pointed uh like the wreck of the edmund fitzgerald or a song where it's just like about a story right um, and I, I could listen to it over and over. I thought Out of Time was great. I wish they would have put Fretless on instead of Radio Song, which which was supposed to happen, but they didn't. Uh, and, and now I, I think that that, like most people, Automatic is the 
is the is the big is the big record that is is a, is a powerful and beautiful record uh, green guy you like green yeah that's a, i think it's an unpopular choice with people because it's like an in-between record yeah and it's a breakthrough album but they had already uh, a bunch of really awesome early i'm never really a fan of early i i don't like early stuff really for led zeppelin yeah but i i like i love late bowie uh and, and the stuff he did in the 2000s and uh lou reed uh, i like the late stuff um and and with rem beatles i don't yeah i'm not i'm not into the early stuff but but green is cool record you know it's a pretty dark record yeah a lot of minor key it's a very somber record I like that about it. It's a heavy without being the Melvins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is heavy. Probably they're heavy. Well, no, later on it gets heavy again. But What do you think it was about prog and art rock that drew you in? Was it just sort of the, um, the cinematic sort of the way that the sounds made you imagine a setting um because it's hard to do with you know the stooges like you know the songs yeah. pound through and, and there's not like a cinematic you don't you don't envision a thing happening listening I, to that i don't no you don't and, and and you recognize that it's i mean the stooges is about something totally different of course dice and mastering your instrument but they both reflect part of the human experience. I have this thought that sitcoms are popular because um, every character in the sitcom reprehends cohesively all the parts of our personality, right? Um, and so I think that we, we make a bad mistake when we are one genre kind of person. I know when you and I were kids, that was kind of the deal you're identified with one genre. Right. And now I don't think kids really do that as much. But, it, you know, I was turned on to the Stooges by this guy named Dan, and I didn't get it. I just didn't get it. I, I lived in the suburbs. I didn't know about urban decay. I didn't know about, you know, just, just the idea of self-destruction as a, a form of communication. Sloppiness, I didn't understand what that meant until I heard the- Punk rock terrified me when I first heard it. I understood punk rock when it was concise. Right. Like, I didn't understand the Sex Pistols, but I understood PAO. Steve Vai playing on the right. untitled record. I was really into that. Now, one of my best friends was uh, in also really into Prague. He ended up uh, being in Deerhoof at Rodriguez. And so, uh, he was the one that was really turning me on to um, to King Crimson, and uh, it's funny. It's like King Crimson, yes, yes, no. <laughs> we did. We weren't listening to yes, you know. We weren't. Our drummer was listening to Rush, but we were listening to Casper Brotsman. And uh, you weren't into yes, though. I've never been into yes, and I'm not. I mean, this dads of the world are going to argue me on that. It just <laughs> it doesn't touch my heart because I think it is. It's coming from a. a I don't think it comes from a place of pain. I think it comes right. from a balanced place of, Anne Rand, <laughs> kind of <laughs> intellectual. Right. Uh, showmanship, you know, and and. Uh, I prefer music that an odd time that is odd because it represents that some people don't fit in, you know, an odd time that is difficult because it is sincere, not because it's difficult because look at the fanciness of this, which I think is legitimate and great, but I, I need to, um, what's what I, I, I want to write an essay about um, how velvet underground people and grateful dead people rarely intermingle right intermingle but it's both jam it's both they're both jam bands right Sister Ray is 26 minutes of noise 
why can I listen to that and not 26 minutes of blues jamming? Does it, so you're not a Grateful Dead fan? I'm not a Grateful Dead listener. Me neither. Now, do you hear that? No. Oh, it is storming. It is storming like crazy here. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, I don't hear it. It's insane. I can't hardly believe it. Um, so what do you think it is that ha- gives that band such an enduring platform that the world, like, why does the world adore the Grateful Dead? Because to me, it sounds like, like a drunk heavy metal bluegrass, like, like acid rock bluegrass uncles falling down a hill playing songs it's just so i saw them a few times yeah because i had friends who were into it and uh and there's just like every like there have been three generations that have come along since they arrived and with each generation there's a whole an entire population fan base and um I just, I don't understand. What do you think it is? Um, it's John Mayer, isn't it? <laughs> I, I, I think that, that our preferences, uh, you know, it's fascinating to me that people like shrimp because I think it's really gross. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm not going to... Um, you know, I'm not going to go out to dinner with a, a friend who's a scholar at the university and he likes shrimp and think this guy's an idiot because he ordered shrimp. Oh, I don't think people <laughs> so, are idiots for liking him. I just don't understand. Yeah, I, I guess I'm not pointing that at you, but in, in generally, you know, uh, it, 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 we tend to disregard things we don't understand. It's human nature. Uh, I, I would imagine that some of it has to do with the sound you were raised on, your personal experience, your relationship to music. And also, you know, when I first watched It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, my friend said, I, I didn't like it. I was like, this is this, I don't get this. And like, you can't just watch one episode, you know? Right. So I imagine with the dead, it's like a lifetime of listening. And I think there's also the culture that goes around with it, you know? I think that's the biggest part. And with the Velvet Underground, there's a different culture that goes around with it. You're learning about New York in the 60s and Andy Warhol and Nico. And you're also hearing this kind of thing that, you know, your dad would go, what, what is this? Your mom would go, turn it down. There's something about hearing Sister Ray. It's noise, but it's not static. It's not metal machine music. I think a lot of it has to do with Sterling Morrison's ability to navigate chromatic notes uh, in and out of the scale. You know, like like Keith Richards talks about how weaving. He talks about the what does he call it in in the in the his, in the Rolling Stones in their own words. He calls it the the maybe it's like the gentle art of weaving. How he believes that two guitarists playing at once should weave. Right. In and out of each other. And and I feel like Lou Lou and Sterling, and then when you get John Cale, whether he's on piano or violin, they they're in they're in this they're in this one singular thing. It and it might not be that they're like a jazz combo where they're all listening to each other, but they're immersed in this world where they're their own characters and but I, I do think that Sterling Morrison is is the glue that holds it together uh, in terms of um, communicating what why noise works. And you hear it a lot in that new song by Stephen Malcolm's Christian Man. That it's Sterling Morrison style guitar. And, and also the solos on the Parquet Quartz albums do that style where you're where you're, there is no key. There's no right. key signature, but it's it it is a it is a conscientious awareness that I am pushing the boundaries of the key. I'm going back in the key. I'm pushing what is pentatonic, what is blues, 
what does blues mean? And, and Lou just plays blues guitar solos. That's all he's ever done. And then you pair that against Sterling Morrison. And then, and then John is just playing a tonal John Cage kind of stuff, whether it's the piano and the, so you come up with um, an unsophisticated take on sophisticated music. Right. Which is really intellectual. So I think the, the, the Grateful Dead thing is more of a spiritual kind of, um, it's kind of like a spiritual connection for people who are just like connected to the music because it, they like the blues scale and doesn't, you know, or they like, I, I don't know, but I, I imagine there's more a spiritual connection to any type of jamming, uh, which might actually be more sacred than songwriting because we are just jamming through life, you know. Did you ever have a jazz phase? Yeah, I studied jazz at the Conservatory of Music uh, starting when I was 11 in Milwaukee, the Conservatory of Milwaukee. And uh, and then I just started doing rock. Uh, but um, yeah, I've always uh, played um, and I have the real book and, you know, I'd, I'd like someday want to do a combo, but uh, jazz is, is really, really beautiful. Uh, agreed. I could, I just, I feel like I can not do it. I think it's something, you know, you have, it's like, you either have to do it a lot if you're not a studied person or you have to go to school and study. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's definitely like a dead thing. It's still alive. Uh, the best musicians I know play jazz. Right. Um, and they have an attitude and an ethic that is open and chill and the, it's it's almost like they the uh, jazz is great because you know we're like i said earlier we're, we're not the um we're not the player we're the instrument right the player is coming from some other place whether it's our subconscious whether it's our like genetic history or whether it's fucking magic uh really to truly improvise to improvise a solo you, you just you listen and you play but you're not really thinking it it's just coming through you you know and uh i i i, I do feel that uh this happens in the velvet underground and and in the grateful dead um this sort of like um transcendental uh space of just leaving your body and just let and just being the vessel which is the opposite of songwriting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which yeah. is my profession. So was piano your first instrument? Yeah, when I was three. Three years yeah. old. And 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 we started, you know, on all the but really I, my thing was a dissonance. Um a dissonance. I think uh, it's every three year olds thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It just it just made a lot of sense to me because and it still does because there's a lot I can't do in life. And when I hear dissonance harmonics and when I hear atonal uh, frequencies, my heart relates to that more, the struggle of existing than it does to like beauty. Uh, so it, it was, it was I, yeah, I would play Bach and stuff when I was older, seven, eight, nine, but three and four was just like nothing. And then five was like, great songs twinkle twinkle little star stuff like that classics <laughs> big but, hits yeah and they're still in all modern music you know twinkle twinkle little star is not dead i mean it's just it's kind of you're kind of just it's just kind of up and down this the major scale right um and I can think of a lot of songs that that do that. The, our formative years really shape future. But I think it's good to 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 not dismiss a simple song um, as 
you know, we're talking about Yes or, or King Crimson, it, complex rock versus simple rock or complex music versus com simple music, it's important not to think that one is more important than the other, you know, because it's not. And I think our ego sometimes can think it is. Sure. And then we're let, we, we miss out on the experience. Um, so when you, so you, your folks obviously were interested in having you play the piano, were they musical? I think that they are musical souls. My, they, my mom was really into the church uh, choir. My dad was too, uh, but you know, they, they come from Milwaukee. They come from working full time. You don't, you know, uh, it, it's, you're raising a family. There's not a lot of time. So I think yeah. I was afforded the privilege of being a suburban kid in a middle income family and not having a ton of uh, popularity. So I just gravitated towards playing the instrument, you know, uh, and, and, but also the instrument gravitated towards me. Uh, I was always playing the piano, but, but I was interested in, in why, I, why the sound, what is that sound that's coming out of the instrument, it's not, it's, where is it coming from? You know, like when you turn the light on and it illuminates the room, you look at the light bulb and you think, where the hell is this light coming from? And I was a kid and I was just thinking, what? I know that the piano is making a sound, but, but where is it coming from? <laughs> and now I know the physics of it, you know, but back then I was just like, it was magic to me. I touched something and I manifested something out of the void, you know? Look, it is still magic that pe that hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, people started making melodic mu music and then melodic music um, very inventively. I mean, look at the most primitive instruments like wooden bamboo flutes and things uh, that they sorted that out is is incredible. Yeah, it's awesome. And glad stringed they did. instruments, every I mean, it's it is magic. It is technology. You know, it is a technology, and uh, I'm glad we don't live in a time when uh, uh, the ability to make a bamboo flute is cutting edge technology. Because <laughs> <laughs> they sound great, but yeah, it's fun to have access to to instruments that that make music on their own and you can just guide i mean we live in a really fun time to be to be a musician you know music musicians gripe about well it's difficult to be it's more difficult to become famous if you don't win the lottery ticket right you know but but wow just to have all the anybody's like jazz you want to explore jazz you have every every jazz album you know within a certain degree at your fingertips and you can record at home for $300 setup. And as far as a time to be an artist, this is the greatest time in the history of human beings, I think. You could buy a used laptop with GarageBand in it, and it's got a load of instruments in it, and you could make a record on that. Yeah. You really could. Yeah. Or not. Like there are free recording applications out there, free soft synths, free, you know. I think what we're in, so if you pick up running, you, you, which I did for until I got a hernia, but which you run to run. Right. Maybe you do a marathon, you train to do a marathon, you do the marathon with all these people and that's it. You know, maybe you have a, maybe you have a, a medal, but nobody is running the marathon to make a career. To be famous. It. And that's, that's where the rub is. That's where we're starting to lose. Music can only be music, something I usually say, because we're losing out on the musicality of the musical experience when we're trying to force music to be something other than what it is. And so like what you're talking about is if you buy a laptop and you make a really fun record, that is beautiful. If you can recognize that you made a record 
and experience that and obliterate this notion that society has put upon us that it's only relevant based on how many people hear it how much it, it's not because it's when i sing happy birthday to you on your birthday what matters is this the connection that we have from me singing this song and celebrating your life and when marilyn monroe sings happy birthday to john f kennedy the context the commodification of it changes and when we compare ourselves we lose the musical experience like um you know so i think that the, the idea of fame being obliterated by the internet and having smaller bands more bands more small acts and instead of like the the most fascist time in music which i think is grunge where you have a very very small amount of different bands to here you go here's five ten bands to choose from here's the music here's music made by 10 different bands right so yeah i i kind of went off on a tangent there but that's a, that's what we do <laughs> the, what is it called fizzy the fizzy's kicking in yeah <laughs> too much uh, so you went from playing twinkle twinkle little star and then maybe some some bach and then all of a sudden your parents start hearing this weird music coming from your bedroom did they have anything to say about it? My parents were so supportive. My dad awesome. was a machinist his whole life. He worked very hard in, in at General Electric. Um, and he loved his job and he's really talented with machinery. But he would say to me, Mark, don't do what I did. <laughs> he's like, don't just follow your heart. If you, if, if you, if you love, uh, what you do, you never work a day in your life. He has, my parents, I'm so lucky because I know a lot of musicians. And in that really special time where you decide what you're going to do with your life, a lot of people become uh, suppressed right. by, right. you know, but my dad was just like, do it, man. Always. He's always been like that. And uh <clears throat> that's really why I, I'm a professional songwriter is because my dad gave me permission. He didn't look down on it. Um, and he didn't, you know, he, he's, he came, he was a runner. He came home from a run and he said, Hey, I want these tapes in a raffle. And he threw me these cassette tapes. And one of them was the fall, which is one of my favorite <laughs> bands. And <laughs> Your dad won a cassette of the fall what was the other one i they were some other bands i'd never heard of i'm sure they were cutouts and like some some music store gave them a bunch of cutouts for the raffle um but like i heard the fall and i was like in high school i was constantly hearing things from the city that were like wow i don't know what this is but i need to find out and, and it wasn't stuff that was happening in the suburbs or ever going to happen in the suburbs. It wasn't, which was like radio or MTV, so. Yeah, yeah, the fall wasn't, I mean, it just wasn't relevant. And it, it's not relevant. It doesn't have a, a beautiful melody. It's not about a beautiful melody. Right. And I was like, for me, I was like, my life, you know, I struggle, I, I struggle all the time. And so my life wasn't about a beautiful melody. So anyways, my parents, like, um, the big thing happened when I met this, we switched teachers to this guy, George Nestler, and it, it was in Waukesha, Wisconsin, it was in the basement of this tiny little, it was not the jazz conservatory, it was this tiny little crappy, dusty music store, we were in the basement, and this guy looked like a doobie brother, He's like, you want to learn the doors? And I was like, yeah, uh, <laughs> the doors, are you kidding? And so like, there's that part of me where at that point, like, this is the music that was like on the radio. This was like real music. I, I, there was no Bach. There was no, you know, uh, 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 
Oscar Peterson playing in my house, but there was the classic rock station. So like there was suddenly then music was coming to fruition. I was bringing music with like learning box to cut or something. I knew that because it was in horror movies and I bring that, but like, you know, learning um, caravan. It's like, I don't know what that is. I don't, and then it's like, Oh, light my fire. Like I know that. Right. And my friends were showing me this atonal stuff. And then, um, and I realized that what I was interested in wasn't something that could be learned. Uh, it was something that you had to experience. Taught. Right. Taught, taught through, through life experience. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's what you hear when you listen to like Crazy Horse. Right. You know, or Joy Division. You're hearing life experience. You're not hearing like something from a from a college educated thing. Zappa's band was always very like those guys are, you know, men and women are clearly learned musicians. Yeah. But yeah. anti establishment. For sure. Hippies. Totally rare time. Oh, it's pretty much some of my favorite. I love the Uncle Meat record. That's your favorite. That's your that's your guy. Because it leaves it has a lot of parody in it. It leads it leaves all this stuff like on apostrophe, all this like kind of like pop format away. And it becomes like rock symphony music. And the LSO stuff is like too out. But yeah, I really like Uncle Meat and, and some of this kind of like orchestral compositions. I like, I really like the Beefheart record. Uh, 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 Trout Mask? Well, the one that he did with Zappa. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, God, what the hell is that record called? Why am I blanking? Uh, it's got, does it have Carolina Hardcore Ecstasy on it? That's, it's that record. But anyway, it's a endlessly amusing for a teenage uh, person and anyone who loves sophomoric humor as well. Bongo Fury. Bongo Fury. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Deb like yeah. the lead off track Deborah Cadabra when it goes into sort of that sort of like noisy call and response uh, is in uh -huh. just tops. Yeah, I, I feel like, I don't know, Beefheart, like, I really uh, didn't come into his own till the later period, for me. Sure. I, I question Trout Mask Replica. It just seems too good to be true. <laughs> that, 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 you know, in a shags kind of way could have just came out of one person in that short period of time. It seems, seems to be more mythologized, but yeah. You know what I like collaborative wise in in that period of music is um, is uh, the Harry Nilsson John uh, Lennon record, Pussycats. I don't even know if I know that record. It's really good. It's really uh, good. I'm gonna check that out. Yeah, yeah. So when you finally started your first band, or when you started to play with other people, how old were you, and and what was that music like? I mean, it was, it was, it was so, we were all like sequestered in this kind of like fascist reality of suburban Wisconsin. And uh, it, it, we all felt like um, there's this language being spoken that we don't understand. And uh, there were these older kids, these punk kids that were actually really um, empowered individuals that were like, you know, renting out the vfw and putting on a show you know right. and it was so empowering to me as a kid uh i was finally like the jocks were like pushing me down in the hall and i couldn't get a girlfriend or a date from anybody and i, I definitely wasn't allowed to explore my gender identity or even wear nail polish where i was it was just such a it's such a horrible kind of one lane reality and it was great for those people who were playing football but for those of us that wanted to like, I don't know, wear a skirt and sing 
cure songs like that was you weren't even allowed to think that way sure in in the late 80s and uh and so punk that's what we did we, i smashed things and and uh sang and then and then i started writing my own material and and then in the in the late 90s was when i really um when i really like was able to sort of start to communicate what i thought i wanted musically so it was nice it was nice that there were punks and it was nice to realize there were a lot of kids that you know still cared about their parents but didn't really want to uh live in in their hometown anymore because it wasn't big enough right there was no sterling morrison there was no lou reed and you I, know i i left my hometown as quickly as possible as well i grew up in a you know i graduated with 52 kids yeah only school in town so also very small great place to get your ass kicked if you were if you looked weird yeah and, and no shade on 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 their hard-working people that raise their kids in in a great place and no shade on on the positivity that happens but there was a lot of fascistic thinking that i didn't identify with uh but i do love my hometown i think it's a really fun place it's the home of les paul um mm -hmm. and and but i got to the city at minneapolis and i realized that that there was some urban decay here and and uh and i went to art school and then i started touring and that was it you know and now i write write for tv shows and stuff it's a little different but right what when you go from writing for for video for a video yeah uh i mean what i don't know what uh if it's Media, whatever yeah sure so you've 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 got this sort of a tapestry that you're painting on this sort of a canvas as opposed to a a song like a pop song where you're writing lyrics and I, I imagine you're writing instrumental music for video mostly uh it depends you know with the rick and morty song i just wrote the lyrics the recent song and i write for general hospital and that's uh fake pop songs uh, but when i scored a picture i scored a, a short film this summer a tv pilot and that was all instrumental, yeah. And I've just been doing it so long that to me, it's like cooking. Like uh, today, you Wait know- Wait a minute, let me pump the brakes for, I just, I wanna make sure that I don't let this just slide by. You write songs for General Hospital. That's amazing. Are it's they still, I, it sounds incredible because there's all this backdrop music and it's usually like, I mean, I guess it's been since, my sisters and and my mom were watching the show that i've seen it but it's as i recall it's all very dramatic emotional music well yeah let me let me say uh um to go back real quick and say that i i i liken it to cooking because some days i'm writing i'm making a bakery some days i'm making steak some days i'm making pasta so to me it's all food to me it's all music you know and sure. so I, I love playing rock shows but i i used to write children's music and i i've been fortunate enough to do a lot of things and i'm very grateful for that um if you think the star wars universe is deep it's got nothing on the general hospital universe <laughs> It's fascinating, and, and I didn't realize it until I got in, involved in this show. There's a lot of people involved in this show, anonymous writers, and uh, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to talk about it or not, but nobody's told me not to. So, um, and it's um, it's a lot of um, incidental music. So it's not really scoring, you know, different. So when I talk about the universe is, um, you know, like, um, uh there's a certain style of music that plays on uh tattooing what is that what is the bar called in star wars oh uh, the tattooing bar i don't know yeah that, i don't know and, and that that and I, it's like uh yeah. looney tunes kind of 
I did a TikTok on that. So I knew, I know a lot about it. I just, it's forgotten. So I don't know, maybe I don't know, but there's going to be listeners that are going to be shouting out all this stuff. And I just, I'm not there right now, but, um, but Greedo did shoot first, just so everybody knows it's my opinion. <laughs> so like you have these different places in the universe of general hospital where we're talking like 40 years of shit has happened right. in one bar. You know, one character's like might murdered somebody and then they cheated on somebody and then they poisoned somebody and their family was in the mafia and it, and it all happened in this bar and there's another bar and there's and these places all have their own incidental music that fits with that vibe that has been established over time and you get in there and you know it's like a lot of things like today i did a tiktok on how bizarre that song by omc and and every time i do a tiktok on a one-hit wonder i go in thinking oh this is just going to be whatever and i come out thinking holy crap this guy who's who did how bizarre had an incredibly difficult existence and it flipped around and then it went back mm. and it's a really deep story on how bizarre and 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 it's it's really sad uh but um so you come into general hospital thinking okay another job you know uh another job that's great i got money coming in uh and then you realize this is like this is a big deal in the soap opera world <laughs> it's the big one yeah for sure the big one and that's really i'm it's really an honor uh it's just an honor uh that i didn't ever see coming in my in my childhood <laughs> but when i speak at schools i i will say like to music schoolers or something i'll say you're going to be able to get to do a version of your dreams right you're not going to do your dream exactly how you see it you're going to do a version of it and because you're doing a version of it you're going to grow as a person because you sometimes you do things they're not entirely what you want and then you learn and you grow and you're like wow this is really really amazing so there are a lot of things that I thought in my 20s about musicians who were making a living not doing original, you know, rock music on a stage or whatever. Like, I had a lot of opinions about people who wrote, you know, who licensed a song to a commercial or whatever. I'll fill in the blank. All Like, played cover song gigs. The list goes on all these ideas that I had about how that wasn't, you know, pure or real, but, uh, you know, I got a mortgage now. <laughs> yeah. They also like, when we think outside of the context of music, if we, music can only be music. If we think outside of that context, there's always a way to tear it down. But when you look at music in and of itself, like a light that turns on just energy emanating from a source, you cannot really tear it down. So when there's judgment, it's actually defeating us and is robbing us of the musical experience. So I think the idea is to get past that place where you are judging the context from which the music is and just going into the the pure music of it and and you can find joy in there unless it's coming from a completely vapid place then you need right. to contextualize it uh, <laughs> i'm sure that plenty of that was me being jealous that i was not inventive or creative enough to find a way to make a living purely from music then in my life yeah but but then you, you take away if we can like the way we can find pure joy from music is to experience it without context, you know? Right. And when you're a kid, you want, you, every kid wants to be a rock star. And I think that's really, an, a, 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 you can't, you got to go for it. However way, whichever way you think, you know, and it's just like only one sperm makes it to become the person that you and i became and the rest of them just died one sperm made both of us <laughs> your dad is talented <laughs> <laughs> your dad our dad <laughs>
<laughs> you know what I'm saying though? Like I do we turn to nature and we, if we turn to like the the <clears throat> the the metaphors that are out there, we realize that like only there's Jack White and there there are a million Jack Whites out there that are just as good as guitar at him as him. Um you know, uh, Cat Power became Cat Power because she didn't sign to Interscope. She was on Matador and Lana Del Rey, Cat Power are friends, but Lana Del Rey, if she would have signed to Matador, she would be Cat Power. Like people, why is Billie Eilish so great? Well, Billie Eilish is great whether or not you put her within contest. But the reason that the world agrees that Billie Eilish is great is because she's signed to Interscope. <laughs> you know? right. So we can find frustration in music when we see it within the context of other things, society, a, an attractive person that's attached to it. And it robs us of our experience to music. It's funny, but like the most sacred time is when you're making it, <laughs> when it's coming out and it's just you and the instrument. And, um, we spend so much time thinking, oh, if I if I get my my music better, then I'll then this thing will this thing will happen, and then I'll be happy because I'm signed to a label. But anyone, whoever has been to a signed to the label, will tell you, no, you'll be less happy once you're signed to the label. Well, you'll certainly have more expectation, and less of it will be fulfilled than if you just do it on your own. Yeah, and I think when we talk about someone like Michael Stipe, he. I don't know him. I'm projecting into him. I met him twice. And one time I ran away. And so, but, but, what, but in line with that type of person who can think in pure terms, like I'm just doing the music because I like it. Whatever happens, happens. Like a Bodhisattva kind of relationship with it. You can really be, you can really have, a, experience a lot of joy. And that's the only way that I can really like, um, write the pieces that I need to write, like for a commercial or, or for, you know, something it, it is, is to be able to, um, I had this commercial one time and somebody, the, the agency said, um, so such and such a company needs a jingle and the, the big agency can't get it. It needs to be so bad that it's good. And I think you're the guy. That's a backhanded compliment. They were right because I got the commercial and it was it was a su successful spot. Um, and what I did, my approach to that was, um, okay, the songwriting needs to be great. The performance is where everyone's screwing up because they're writing these really clever songs and they're performing them, performing them really good. What you need to do to have a song that's so bad it's good is write a really great song and have a terrible performance. So I recorded the song in 10 minutes, one track, one pass on vocals, a Cassia tone keyboard really fast. And it's a terrible performance of a really catchy song. But I wouldn't have been able to write that song if I was thinking, you know, oh my God, you're writing an embarrassing song. This is so bad. And if I go to the YouTube comments of that commercial, people are like, who made this abomination? What is this? This is the worst thing I've ever heard. In my mind, I'm like, that's great. Cause that's what we wanted. Right. They don't know that. And a lot of times, a lot of commercials are like, how could, how could that song be on a commercial? It's so bad. And you're like, it's not stupid people making these commercials. It's a right. lot of really smart people making this decision <laughs> to make a song that sounds like that and annoys you. And so, um, but it, it is like judge, judgment that, that prohibits us from writing really awesome music. That idea that, you know, I can't, I can't, I cannot make certain type of music or I cannot, you know, and I still was like channeling the beyond to write that stupid song, you know, still the same process that you would use writing a piece of music that you really, really adore. Right. How interesting are those emails? They're like, we need a 30 second spot. References are Mazzy Star and, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. Or it's usually something much more contemporary. And I always talk about <laughs> this, this, this. I did a series of music for Kmart in, in 2010. And a really progressive company was spearing this campaign. 
And I don't want to say any more than that because they, because it's just respectful to everybody involved. But um, they sent me, they said, do you know what this song is? And it was the Harlem Shake by Bauer. Okay. And I said, that's trap music. That's called trap music. And I got in back and as a, a smart, I mean, this, this person who, who ran the music end of this agency was a, uh, at one time assigned to a label, like it knows everything about music. And he was like trap. And I said, yeah, it's called trap music and I can make you a bunch of trap music. So I made a bunch of trap music at the very beginning of trap. And when Bauer was like the beginning of, of this genre, and I never would have been able to, I never would have explored it on my own. I didn't even know it was, when Trap came out, it, we thought, it, oh, it's just a trend. We didn't right. realize it was a movement. And, and it's still, it's now that it's still out there that that 30 second note hi-hat is a, like, a, is going to be a part of music history forever. And, um, and so what's so cool about that is I don't look at these, I like that you said, how weird is it? You know, uh, I worked on a movie trailer once where they said, you know, the music needs to sound like somebody running down a hill. And I was like, give me an instrument, give me a tempo, give me, what do you want? You know, but <clears throat> when I realized that these are really smart people, these are, this is top stuff. This is top tier stuff. And these are people that climb their way through the ranks. Um, and I see it from their side, empathetically. I see it, what they're, and I realize, oh, okay. And then when I see the spot or when I see the TV show or something, it fits in perfect. I, I did this children's music for like three years and it just never made sense until I saw the final product. Because like when you make an album, it's a thing. But when you're scoring, you're part of a thing. So you're making a thumb to a hand. It doesn't make any sense until you see the, the hand and you're like, wow, that was really dumb until, <laughs> until the burgers were there. And now I realize. So a lot of it is putting yourself, yourself back and recognizing these people know what they're talking about. And it's not a language I necessarily um, speak about when I speak to the band and I say it needs to sound like a construction site you know <laughs> so the, those emails are th there's not a lot of you know a lot of times like if, if they would say like this needs to sound like Mazzy Star they would just go to Mazzy Star to get it so usually what they're saying is you know it's not really you're not like ripping off Mazzy, Mazzy Star they're what they're really saying is we need a slow acoustic piece right that's mellow that's gonna change keys at this point and that is gonna end at 13 seconds and there's gonna have a zing at the end, you know? And it makes no sense as a song by itself. And then when you see the spot, which I don't do commercials anymore much, but when you see the spot, it all fits. It, another thing is like- um, you, would never get the, you would never get the clip to, to compose to? Um, so a lot of times, I mean, it, everything is so different every single project yeah. is different you have different people you have different desires uh different uh desires from the client and the and in that way but in movie trailers what's interesting is uh the movie composer is not working on the trailer most of the time I, I, maybe you know all this stuff already so i don't want to um but your listeners might not so um the 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 trailer is being made independently, especially in, so in the 2000s, it was like a company and now you pitch, a bunch of people pitch on a trailer. But in the 2000s, they'd say, hey, you know, here's, I don't know, I'm just gonna, uh, I'll, I actually, I'll, um, I'm not sure what, I should pick a movie I worked on or not. So anyways, they'll just, let's, we'll make up a movie, right? Um, uh, independent werewolf, right? We're just throw a name. Out. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> this is a. It's about a, a werewolf of. Uh, it's like wolf instead of Wolf of Wall Street. It's Werewolf of Wall Street. <laughs> so independent werewolf, uh, and then they might be like. Uh, it's got to be electronic. It's got to be. It's got to be open ended. Me meaning like um, I don't want to. Um, that third, 
that the third that defines the triad major to minor. Uh, if you listen to like um, the Atticus Ross and Trent Reznor score for um, Social Network, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of thirds in there. There's a ton of just uh, fifths and and tonics, and, and that that what's that what's what that allows to do in a score is it sets the tone of the space, but the script and the and the interactions between the people can can go from major to minor very fast with the music st kind of staying constant like uh, tangerine dream kind of did that too in the in the um, risky business soundtrack so um so i go back now to uh <laughs> to the trailer music and they might say you know it needs to be really evil or it needs to be open-ended and uh we're not done with the cut yet because we don't have the footage yet uh <clears throat> because everything's down to the wire and the trailer is the very last thing and the music is the very, very last thing. And right. there might be two or three other composers working on the trailer. So a lot of times, you know, like you won't even know what the movie is. And it's just like, very rarely do you want to score a picture on a trailer. You know, it's more, it's more about the editor is doing the music composing on a trailer. Um, uh, but I have done some commercials where they want cues where you're running in a 4-4 four, four time signature, the beat is 4-4, four, four, you're going in like a Mark Mothersbaugh kind of like Wes Anderson score kind of thing, but you have these changes that are happening at like 10.5 seconds and 15.8 seconds and then you have to like change keys and you have to like change and you're right in the middle of the time signature so you have to add these beats and it's incredibly what we're talking about like prog music it's inc you're like running in odd times and you're running in key changes changing but then you see the commercial and you're just like oh it's an insurance company right <laughs> well luckily i mean <gasps> imagine scoring to cartoons back like for you know bugs bunny or something that i can't even imagine it's so intricate and, and again, we live in a time when we can digitally edit things. It's incredible. Like, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if they were even getting into like splicing tape back then. I mean, Carl Stalling. Uh, I don't really I haven't read about it, you know, I imagine that <clears throat> those cartoons took a long time to make and then they would do it just he would score it and I should read, read a book on it because I don't even know how they did that stuff. And like modern cartoon music still does that. You know, it's like uh, for kids, not adult cartoons. Right. On point, like everything is scored a picture. Somebody falls and it makes a sound. And, and then, but if you listen to it on its own, like that Carl Stalling record that came out, it's like, what? It's incredible. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the Randy Newman score to A Bug's Life is so incredible you know i think scores should be like stage lighting in a in a play you you don't realize it's even happening right uh and a good score doesn't draw away draw attention to itself you know i think that's one of the flaws of the jaws soundtrack is in the in the happy parts i i, I don't know i feel like john williams like peak later like jurassic park and stuff but some of the stuff is like drawing attention to the score in a way that like I don't think is beneficial to the total movie again like I'm saying like a hand the thumb is a part of the hand but that ominous theme of Jaws is one of the most recognizable movie sound bites of all time right yeah for sure and, and it's, it's been referenced so many times yeah and if you watch Creature from the Black Lagoon uh, about it's about halfway through when the woman, the the female, I think there's just one female in that movie, is swimming. You can hear it. Really? <laughs> yeah, it's there, and I, I I saw it, and I was like, wow, he had to have watched this. He, there's right. no question that he saw Creature of the Black Lagoon, listened to the score, and drew from it. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, you know, I mean, fuck, John Williams, incredible, incredible. But, um, 
I, I think like with cartoon music, you, you're, you're still not drawing attention to the score because it's so wrapped up in the action of the main character, you know? And the Bugs Life score does that so well. Like you don't even realize the orchestral score, not like, you got a friend in me, not that, <laughs> which is a great song too, but the or Randy Newman orchestral score right. is, is astounding. It's like Flight of the Bumblebee on Fleek. Um, it's great. We we should wrap up at some point relatively soon because my dog's got to go out and pee. But yes. um, would you like to meet my dog? Come here, Rosie. Come here, honey. She's uh, she's afraid of the storm, so she's down at my feet. Yeah, Rosie. That's Rosie. Rosie, say hi over here. Oh yeah. Rosie's cute. Do you does Rosie know the Jackson Brown song? Uh, I don't know. She's definitely heard "Ramblin' Rose" by the MC5. It's uh, about masturbating, <laughs> and it goes. Uh, it's about being on the road. And uh huh. Rosie, you're all right. You wear my ring when you hold me tight. Rosie, that's my thing. When you turn out the light, I gotta hand it to me. Looks like it's you and me again tonight, Rosie. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a beautiful song. Uh, that's hilarious. Yeah, so that's not why you named her Rosie. No, no, she was a rescue. She was a <laughs> rescue. Beauty. Oh, Rosie. Um, if if the pandemic was gone, you know, if, if everything was back to normal, uh, this is fantasy speak. Next month, what would you what would you do? Would I be aware? of it of it or or am i not aware because if i if everything well, this is current that, reality like if if, if the timeline happened. of things were just like hey it's it just petered out and it's gone and now we're back to normal everybody go back to normal i would cry i would be disappointed in in human beings i would be disappointed in the selfishness and ignorance and fear and politicians for manipulating innocent minded individuals who are just trying to seek their own personal truth and trusting clickbait. And uh, I would be really bummed out for, you know, the same people who said um, that they were being safe and they weren't. And I would be sad for all the people that died. And um, I, I would cry. It, it the same way that when my infected molar was pulled uh, in the hospital uh, in that not in the university hospital dental section, uh, I cried when that tooth was pulled. It was such a relief, and the pain was over. I think when you're the lobster in the pot, it's hard to cry because you don't see things just end. You know, you're you see the slow. You don't even see the slow decline. Uh, so if it were all just to end, um, it, it, would, it would feel to me like um, walking in on the body of your friend, just really, really sad. But um, if it never happened, uh, I would be sitting around complaining about things that weren't, weren't nearly as bad. Right. I feel like it's... Uh, so existential it's so bizarre it's so much beyond music and beyond our goals and representative of of us i, I sometimes i just feel like it, it seems so absurd but you would hear a lot of this you'd, you'd hear a lot of this stuff like after the uh assault on the capitol and and just everything was really upside down you'd hear people say if space if aliens landed i wouldn't be surprised you'd hear I, that. I said that <laughs> yeah, and and when the when the 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 documents were were released in June this year, I was really hoping that it would give us more of a clue. But sometimes I just feel like you know, in answer to your question, it, I ask ask you this: if the aliens landed a month from now and they said we're going to save your planet, <laughs> how would you feel? 
I mean, it would feel like an undeserved bailout. I feel like we've failed in so many ways. Earlier, you had men you mentioned something about television programs and the characters in them in the sitcoms representing all the facets of our our subliminal characters, you know. Yeah. And our and and at that time in our conversation, I was thinking about this that we're sort of like touching on now in that we also, you know, in addition to living in the golden age of technology for, for artists and creatives, we, we live in a golden age of uh, story arc television series, right? Yeah. You know, that arguably began with Lost or The Sopranos or I don't know what, you know, Deadwood or something and and continues and and you know we 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 experience all these characters who are good and bad and do all these things i guess fucking general hospital like there are people who you see have you know who are very complex but yet within our own reality dealing with people that we, you know, are, we're supposed to be united on, un, you know, under a flag or under a, but or as a, as a human race, even we cannot, uh, we can't see anything but divisive black and white lines. It's like, you're good, you're bad. I don't agree with you. And, uh, that's, that's a sad thing to me. It's, I, and it's, ferociously ironic if aliens were to land <laughs> then, then we would and they were to bail us out they if they were just like here's the technology to save your climate here's the technology to kill all the viruses and then leave um <clears throat> we wouldn't we wouldn't know the danger <laughs> because we would be saved but i think it would be nice to have peace of mind that there would be no more suffering and no more sadness on the on the level that is impending at this point so i wish they would i think that once you get to a point in a culture where you're banking on the impossible you've become that's a that's a that's that shows how how desperate you are um, do you think that we are inherently sad though like oh i mean the sadness the sadness the reciprocal sadness from the actions that are happening right the suffering of people due to the greed of others i mean it's, it's, the whole thing is greed based don't you believe that if the aliens took off and didn't stick around to sort of govern the usage of this technology that someone would figure out a way to weaponize it and then we would go and use that to geo uh, manifest other livable places and we would fuck them up too? <coughs> we, have a, we have a real bad track record of this, you know? <laughs> But we're still alive. I don't know. I mean, I can tell you about music and how <laughs> structures work, but like Elon Musk might be able to tell you a little bit more about what would happen or what he, he thinks should happen with the technology. But even then, you know, uh, <laughs> Madame Curie might give you a, I don't fucking know, man. I just wish the aliens would land and save us because it's hard to like be creative and it, it, when there's so much oppression and from a future from a future that's in doubt you know <laughs> right so i don't know right now i'm just going to be working on writing my next book so that'll be that'll take me from a different place than writing albums so that'll be good so i feel like we didn't even touch on that and oh. yeah we talked a long time are you going to edit this down no way <laughs> no way that's not my style 
okay well to my dad who is still listening we have uh, uh this is uh this is kind of how it always go you know i mean it doesn't always go quite like this conversation every conversation is a bit different you know but oddly enough a lot of times we end up touching on alien stuff or you know religious stuff or there's a lot yeah. of alien talk yeah yeah uh well i that's i hope they come i hope they come i hope they save us and and uh, if we do one thing I, I i thought about recently is if we do live in a matrix maybe the afterlife is part of the matrix maybe there's a lot of afterlives um but uh until then i'm just gonna i guess keep having fun and and doing just frivolous things that impact people's lives in a way that makes them smile yeah i hope so i i uh i love your music and um i love the positivity in it uh even in the in the music itself outside of the the message the music yeah. is like feels uplifting and i, I really I appreciate mean, that I guess the point of, of my music has always been, you know, if you want to die, you're not alone. Don't do it. Right. And, and the different variations of that. It, when I was really drinking uh, in my, <clears throat> around the period of my sixth and seventh albums, uh, label records, um, uh, Invincible Criminal and Between the Devil and Middle Sea, they became more like critical of rock music history. And then when Double Silhouette came out, I had quit drinking and I was just writing confessionals, which the last three albums have been confessionals, you know, just here's shit that's been happening in my life. And <clears throat> the weird thing about writing so much about happiness and learning so much about happiness and the power of music in regard to creating happiness is, is you know, I didn't do it because I am happy. I do it because I need to feel happy. Uh, <laughs> so it's like uh ironic uh it's medicinal i'm creating happy music because i i'm trying to push it out there uh i can't i can't afford right now to write in the minor key though the new album does have some dark songs uh, are you still not drinking oh yeah i'm done yeah, yeah. i'm retired. Every rock bottom but my body just told me it's time to stop and I did, I had a good, I had a good 10, 11 years, had a great time and uh, I don't regret anything from it. But like I said, you, you know, I don't really need to go to Disneyland a million times to know what it, the experience is. And, and it has changed my music dramatically. Uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't have no shade to people who can control it, but. Good for you. I'll, I, I quit drinking years ago as well and it's probably I might not be alive if I didn't. So I hope we move to a, a culture that kind of lets go of this myth uh, that music and alcohol have anything to do with each other, because that's a marketing myth that was created by, you know, marketing people in the 70s and perpetuated in the 80s that you needed to. There's like, like I keep talking about music in regard to turning on a light, like whether you're drunk or whether you're sober you turn on a light just the same. Like music has nothing to do with substances. It has as much, has more to do with food than it does controlled substances. But we've just been indoctrinated to thinking, oh, okay, if you want to do this as a career, you better drink, you better sing about. And it's like, man, they're robbing us of, of the experience. They're both great things that, that can, in, they can exist independently of each other, <laughs> you know? Sure. So, so I think, Gen Z recognizes that more than we, than our generation Gen X did. Good for them. Yeah, I think so. It's, I'm really positive about this generation, musically especially. I think hyperpop is crazy. Um, yeah, musically, there's so much exciting stuff happening right now. Um, this is Mr. Big. Okay, Mr. He's, Big. He's the biggest dog. Can't you? Is that a band? Him? Uh, it that was a band is a band yeah but this this is Mr. Big okay aren't you this is the biggest dog yeah the band was named after Mr. Big uh assumably yeah yeah um I really had a great time talking with you man I yeah. I appreciate you giving me so much time um 
And uh, I hope that if you come through New York, I'm up near Albany. I'm in near Hudson, between uh, Hudson and Albany. Mm -hmm. But we go that we're in the city a lot. So I hope that if you come through this uh, way, you'll let me know and I'll, I'll keep my eyes peeled too. Yeah, I, I have to say, I would love to go up there because I, I love the Hudson School of Painting. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so I would love to see it up there. It's great up here. It's a, you know, it's a beautiful part of the country. We we got a lot more storms lately. You know, uh, there was a time when uh, upstate New York had the most UFO sightings in the country. Is that right? Yeah, it was around the time of of communion, Whitley Strieber's communion. But I feel like I remember reading that. But you haven't seen anything, huh? I saw something in Seattle that, and I wasn't the only one that saw it um it was at night a bandmate of mine saw something in the middle of the day in seattle that uh, that an entire you know section of town traffic stopped and people got out of their cars and were looking at it wow yeah wow and didn't make the news you know it's it's because they're living in the ocean down at the bottom of the ocean and that's why they're coming up good to coastal towns well in seattle i was riding my motorcycle home from uh, seeing a show and i was riding along the uh, duwamish river and i was stopped at a light and so it was loud but you know some it was hard to tell how far away this thing was but it was illuminated and it was moving smoothly it wasn't a helicopter that would have been loud. It wasn't that far away, but because of the darkness, it was hard, hard to tell the size and how, and just how far away it was. But someone pulled up next to me and I was just looking at this thing and we, I realized someone was next to me and I turned to them and they're, and they're just pointing and they're like, do you fucking see that? And at that point I, I just blew the red light and followed it, chased it. But it, it just like, and it followed the river up uh, to the sound up by the ferries. And then that was it. I didn't, I didn't see it, but. Amazing. I, ha- you know, I don't know. I don't know what it was, but That's I'm, amazing. I didn't imagine it. Be, you know, someone else. Some, um, fortunately, someone else saw it. A car full of people were there to make, you know, I'll give, <laughs> give me reassurance that i wasn't imagining something extraordinary so yeah well next time we uh next time i if i ever see it uh, i stayed in a haunted hotel a couple nights ago in uh, red wing minnesota really uh, if I, yeah mm-hmm. it was a it's a historic hotel called the saint james and people go there sometimes to to experience it a haunted hotel and uh, but I haven't I've never experienced uh, uh, any encounters that I'm aware of with with UFOs. And, and if I do, I, I want to do a special uh, I'll, I'll call you and we'll do a special episode if you would like. Uh, I'll tell you. Oh, I would lo- yeah, I'd love it. Though. But I haven't. I think it's because I don't really go outside much. So that- <laughs> <laughs> you got to put a skylight in your studio, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe they'll come and just like uh, uh, shine a light right through the skylight. <laughs> they'll beam you up i'm ready right me too <laughs> well uh mark you're great as are you friend um do you have uh, i bet a fellow like yourself has a couple of promotional photographs that you'd share with me that i could cut up and manipulate and make some posts with For sure. I'll, send, I'll email you those right now thank you so much yeah and then uh uh, we won't mention the name. Actually, I'll just kill the I'll kill the podcast here. Um, stop recording. <laughs>